Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is our 106th video cast, 96th podcast for the week ending October 28th, 2021. Getting ready for Halloween. Uh, our club's having a, a party on Saturday night, so the little ones will be going as the uh, devilish one will be going as an angel, and the angelic one will be going as a devil, so that'll be very cute. And my wife, Caitlin, and I will be cowboy and cowgirl. So I'm getting a little scruff going uh, just to just to get in the mood and uh, should be a fun time. My second choice, of course, was Ted Lasso, but it looks like Mitt Romney beat me to the punch. Uh, I thought that was pretty clever. So uh, after hours today, it's Thursday. It looks like uh, tech stocks are a little weak after Apple and Amazon missed. Uh, app Apple just missed on the top line, missed on devices in particular. The iPhone services were up better than expectations, and Amazon missed on the top and bottom line. So we'll know more after the call, uh, but that's what's happening in real time. Uh, Want to uh, do quickly uh, media, and then we'll get right to it. We've got a lot to cover this week. I uh, want to thank Liz Clayman and Ellie Terrett for having me on the uh, Fox Business, The Clayman Countdown on Friday. Uh, we talked about bonds and really made a non-consensus view that I think you'll find interesting. We're going to dig into deeper detail in the article of the week. So thanks again to Ellie Terrett and Liz for that. Uh, also want to thank uh, Chibuke Ogu for including me in his article on Reuters earlier this week, my quote was, the number one thing is that earnings are better than expected. And what's more interesting is that as we approach the end of the year, we're going to see forward guidance being lifted, which would make the market multiple more reasonable. And uh, and that still holds true despite uh, what's going on with Apple in the after hours. Uh, and we'll discuss why and, uh, and how well uh, earnings are doing across the board. I want to do a couple of uh, Ask Me Anything questions of the week. Um, Okay, first one is from Matt Mitchell. Tom, thanks for posting these podcasts, video casts. I find them quite educational. I've been following a little over a year and a half. Not sure if this is the right spot to throw in a question of the week, but was wondering what your thoughts are on using systematic value screens to narrow down your universe of investment opportunities. I uh, know you like to find beat up segments of the market and do top down bottom up analysis to find great companies at bargain prices. But do you ever screen across sectors based on value, quality metrics? For example, Joel Greenblatt's magic formula, which ranks companies according to their aggregate combination of earnings yield, uh, value, and return on capital quality. Uh, could this be a good place to start the search for new opportunities? Thanks for the time and keep up the great work, Matt. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question, Matt. Um, Yes and no, and, and I'm going to tell you why I lean towards no. Um, I, I read Greenblatt's book many years ago. Um, in the book, he said, you know, the the, the core principle was, uh, as you pointed to, return on invested capital, uh, and certainly that's a good metric. Uh, when he was doing it, he, uh, in the book, he claimed annualized returns of over 30% on that method. Uh, whether it it worked to that level and then diminished over time, uh, or it just ran out of favor. Uh, there was a back test of market performance between 2003 and 2015 that found that the magic formula strategy had annualized returns of 11.4%. Uh, and But in fairness, that's compared to 8.7% from the S&P 500. So still alpha there. Uh, still worthwhile, but not in line with uh, expectations around, you know, when you read the book and what you expect to happen. Um, and that's from uh, Investopedia. Uh, you know, Joel Greenblatt's a great manager. I think that's a starting point. You know, if, if you had to peg me to a fundamental screen, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking at uh, price to free cash flow. Uh, and then you kind of start from there and it's just another uh, way to you know screen down cheap stocks but what you're going to find and we've discussed this a lot it's not just getting cheap stocks it's why is it cheap so for instance i have these in order of uh lowest price to free cash flow so here is in in the list view um you know and you start with companies like credit suites now credit suites it looks cheap you go and you take a look at the chart and you're like, wow, you know, it's really cheap. This might be an opportunity. And it might. 
problem is I would never buy Credit Suisse because every time SHIT happens on Wall Street, they're always dead in the middle of it. It's either Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank always find themselves in the SHITTIEST of deals and problems consistently. Like, it, you know, whether it's the um, uh, blow up of the, uh, of the family office uh, that we saw earlier this year, whether it's the credit default swaps, uh, whether it's mortgage-backed securities, it's like Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank, you can always count on them to uh, be last out and always losing uh, when it comes to uh, sy systemic risk. So there's just a risk management problem. Uh, they're also very consistent with always putting out, uh, all the European banks are, the most bearish notes all the way through the bull market, every single turn, always looking for the next shoe to drop. That that just tends to not happen. And then every 10 years, they're right. Uh, but um, so, so anyway, here's a great example. Low fundamental metrics, great looking chart, out of favor. And could this thing rally up to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60? Sure. But I, I just find them, you know, when they get going, they always find a way to screw it up. And that's just from experience knowing them. Then you've got China Life Insurance. I mean, again, that's probably something I want to stay away from because it's just, there's no real mode. It's not like an Alibaba. Petrobras, long term, sure, I like that. I mean, um, um, Bolsonaro was talking about uh, fully privatizing it. That's a positive thing. That's probably got a long term view. So these are just kind of cheap stocks and uh, energy transfer. Love it. Absolutely would be involved there. Uh, Ford's already had a move here. I mean, yeah, there may be some follow through, but that's that's already there. Uh, Discovery, sure. So, you know, you get some ideas looking at the longer term. City is probably among the cheapest banks. Um, Occidental, I still like here for the long term, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, th this would be a better metric from a starting point from my point of view. It's simple. It's price to free cash flow. And then I can start my general analysis from there. But as far as the magic formula, I mean, look, three points of alpha uh, over time is pretty valuable, but it's not like a be all do all. Uh, but but definitely uh, looking at factors uh, is is certainly uh, an input that you can have in a whole mosaic. It's got it's got to be more than that. It's got to be quantitative and qualitative largely fundamental. You have to have some backgrounds in technicals just so you can get a better sense of good entry points and exit points. I mean, actually looking at the screen, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, Viatris, a uh, generic manufacturer, I think these are going to be great over the next three to five years. Teva's recently been beaten down. I like this whole group. Uh, Cardinal Health, definitely like this. That's kind of in line with the Cigna. So these are, these are cheap stocks. I mean, um, IBM, here's one that's cheap that I wouldn't buy. So you, you just, you know, you, you go through the quantitative metrics and, um, you know, EOG, great. Uh, Rocket, we like, we like this story moving forward. It's going to take a little while to play out. What has to happen with Rocket is that we're going to talk a lot about it is that, um, a lot about rates is that Taper has to be announced, and, and if the 10-year yield is somewhere between uh, 2 and 2.5% two and when that happens, that could very well be the peak in yields for the next handful of years, uh, in which case, uh, as yields start to back off after Taper starts, uh, which is counterintuitive, and we'll go into why in this in this podcast video cast. Then these stocks are going to take off because they're trading down on fear of zero refinance business moving forward, and it's just simply not going to be the case. Um, Viacom. So yeah, so this is a good screen. Uh, AT and T, and we'll talk about some of these because these these have been cheap and they've stayed cheap, and when they turn, they're going to turn. But when you know what you're buying, you're buying cash flow for the cheapest possible multiple. So is the underlying business permanently impaired? And in many of these cases, the answer is no. Uh, Nokia had a great quarter uh, just now. They kind of operate in a 5G duopoly with Ericsson almost. Um, some Brazilian stocks here, uh, Banco Santander. You know, these are, these are higher risk, but when you look at the cash that they generate and what you pay, uh, Cigna, of course, well, this happens to be, uh, we own it. Uh, well, Walgreens boots, we happen to own, um, Canon be perfectly fine with that Japanese company. A couple Chinese companies are in here. Biogen. That's just a question of when, 
um, uh, Bristol Myers. So a lot of these drug stocks that got beaten down, they'll find their bottoms over time. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. So a lot of the, the picks that we've been talking about actually wind up on this list. Price to free cash flow, you can do that for free on um, Finviz. So that's a good starting point, but it's it's not the be all end all. Uh, quickly, oh, the second question came from Shannon uh, Sabin. Watch the interview with that school of Bristol. Uh, you, yeah, the, the uh, Q&A I did. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, uh, I've had a lot of people call me up and, and uh, uh, really say they got a lot out of that. So um, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, definitely worthwhile. Had a couple more universities ask me to talk to them and uh, a couple podcasts and that type of thing. Uh, lots of interesting content. You mentioned writing up trades, specifically the soybean trade. Would you be willing to share one or more examples of write-ups? I have a small group of friends, and we are always exchanging ideas, but I would love to put structure, more structure around it. And I come from the school of P&G, where share and reapply is heavily encouraged. If you don't mind sharing, I'd, I'd happy reapply. Okay, so uh, I tried to, by the way, look up that writing that uh, write-up I did for uh, for Corn Cornwall actually, but it was on the um, server at the first hedge fund I worked at, so I don't I don't have access to that anymore, and I didn't take my emails when I left. You're not allowed to do that. Um, but there, I did send Sh uh, Shannon a couple equity uh, write-ups that she could use as models. A few good places you can find those. Um, uh, you can go to sumzero.com. A lot of hedge funders post their uh, fundamental write-ups there. Uh, you can go to valueinvestingclub.com and pull some ideas there. And sometimes you'll even find a couple uh, good ideas on seekingalpha.com. But it's basically just doing the deep fundamental analysis, going, reading through all the conference calls, reading through all the annual reports, comparing the metrics to peers in, in other industries, reading all the sell-side research, and then drawing your own conclusion based on what are the catalysts that's going to make it move, why are you buying it, uh, and what's going to make it change. So, um, but but those three places you can find hundreds of write-ups from from qualified professionals, and that'll give you a model. So then you can do your work as you pick an idea and and do it. But the better thing to do is not to try to fit into some perfect mold, is to have your thesis uh, and and. Um, write it down. You know, every time you do a trade, you should be writing down a page of why you're doing it. Not that you're just jumping on the latest shiny, shiny object or what's hot or some headline, um, but that you've actually done real work so that um, when you when you know what you own, and I say this over and over, when it moves against you, you you're adding versus puking out and then letting it take off at, without you, which happens to to retail and new people over and over and over. It's just a process. You have to learn patience over time and um and the more money you get over time the more patient you can become uh you know when when you're running you know when you're managing five cents you're trying to double it every week and you wind up losing it all uh and then as you you know build your wealth over time through learning and experience um you're more patient and that's where the bigger returns come from uh over time and uh, and they come and when they turn, they turn hard in, in, in a very positive way. So, um, OK, what am I looking at here? Oh, price to free cash flow. We did that. All right. Uh, just a quick thing. I don't want to do all the stock market metrics this week because we've got a lot of other stuff to cover, especially around rates, because this was a tricky week. Um, OK, so this is just bullish percent by sector as the market gets a little bit uh frothier and it feels like it's like you know a little bit toppier i wouldn't say toppier because we're pushing into year end but um you know it's moved a lot where where is there still value and you can see that even if the general indices grind uh there there's opportunity you know communication services here is still weak uh some nasdaq is still weak some consumer discretionary. So, you know, these are areas you would be sellers. These are generally areas you're, you're buyers. Uh, energy, this is what we talked about last week. It was getting frothy. Uh, I think we do see that pullback. And um, there are a couple things on Iran that we'll cover this week that I think are going to lead to it. We also had crude builds this week. It's just, you know, I'm telling you, when people start you know, people buying options for $200 oil when the forward curve is at 60, you just like, 
okay, the morons have arrived. Now we got to wash them out and then we'll buy back 10 or 15% lower. And for those of you who have core positions as we do from last year at very low bases, uh, you know, maybe you'll top up a little bit if we get a 15, 20% pullback on some individual names that are up 100, 125%, et cetera. Uh, financials, you know, both of these, everyone's calling me, oh, tell me about banks and oil. And we went through this last week. No, I want to tell you about Chinese stocks. That's where that's where the opportunity is. You know, last year, no one would talk to me about banks and energy when I was pounding the table. Uh, this year, no one will talk to me about Chinese stocks and I'm pounding the table. And uh, and that's where the opportunity is. And everyone wants what the new shiny object. They're all chasing energy and banks after they're up huge. They're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Yeah, could could they go up five, ten percent more before pulling back? They could. But again, there's there's bigger opportunity in places that are overdone. Gold miners, I wouldn't touch them with a 10 foot pole, but they are setting up here for those of you who like gold. Uh, maybe that maybe there's some opportunity there. I won't even talk about them or look at them. They always find a way to make money even when gold doubles, but uh, to lose money even when gold doubles. But uh, there may be some opportunity there. Uh, in uh, again, the Dow uh, industrials we've been talking about, uh, they're still nowhere near overdone. They're just getting started. Um, we did tech already. Materials starting to move, but still have room. Um, NYSE stocks, that's more industrial type stocks, uh, just getting started, more room to move. Uh, real estate, kind of no man's land. Um, staples just getting started plenty of room to go uh, telecom like the AT&T's and Verizon's they're cheap as hell I think that you know you can buy them for the long term pick up a 5% 6% dividend while you wait um, transports are starting to move so that would include some of the airlines which we like Southwest United Airlines etc and what else utilities uh, some utilities are still cheap here so i think there's going to be some opportunity in those places especially as uh, you know people start to anticipate liquidity coming out and they want a little bit more defensive uh, that said i love the peter lynch quote that we put out this week uh, far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in corrections themselves uh, i think september was a perfect example of that uh, and then this is apropos for everything that's happening right now, whether it's crypto or some of these uh, stocks that are that are really frothy. And Philip Fisher says the market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. And um, you have to keep that in mind. Um, there was a commentator that went on uh, one of the major stations this week. And when, you know, they were saying, well, this stock is breaking out. So we like this very much. Uh, we want to buy the new highs. It's blue high, blue skies type of thing. Uh, and um, and the commentator said, well, tell me a little bit about what they do and their business model. And, and the person was like, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And they're like, there's no static in the line. And, you know, so, you know, you just. Guys, you, you got to know what you own, uh, and uh, and that's where, um, you know, the, this is this is a function. This right here, a ton of people who know the price of everything and the value of everything. This is a function of zero cost capital, and when capital starts to have a price, which is which is coming as taper comes and uh, growth comes and uh, those type of things, and interest rates start to tick up a bit. Uh, a lot of the excesses are going to be washed out. So these areas that have been value areas that have been cheap, uh, when they're, they're what we call short duration assets, they become more valuable when the discount rate goes up. Uh, people want the earnings today versus the long duration tech earnings that are down the road. Uh, and then people will have to know what they own uh, or they're going to just get smoked. I mean, this 10 times sales and 20 times sales uh, charade that's been going on with free money for 10 years is, is coming to an end. It, it's just a question of is it three months from now, nine months from now, or or 15 months from now, but um, the malinvestment will get flushed. 
uh, and there will be a lot of pain, and that's a good thing. And that's that's what the what what the market does is it it cleanses itself. And whether that pain is in the public markets or in the private markets or in you know SHIT coins or whatever it happens to be, uh, the malinvestment will get flushed out as it does every single cycle. Uh, update on Alibaba. You know we had this big run up, 30% off the lows. It's consolidating and taking a breather here the last few days because uh, you had the COVID breakout in China again uh, and everything else. But this is very similar. We saw a very similar situation in uh, 2018 after the last online gaming crackdown. You had this big rally up and then it just uh, consolidates a little bit sideways for a couple of weeks and then it just takes off again. So, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. This is a natural breather. And the other thing that was interesting, uh, this is in Zero Hedge. Jack Ma visits the Dutch Agricultural Research Institute as disgraced billionaires foreign tour continues. So... One thing is they they let him out of the out of hiding, I guess. Number one, but number two is he's actually doing the Communist Party bidding. Um, you know, earlier this month he was in Hong Kong. First instance of him being allowed to leave China since the Great CCP Tech Crackdown began in late 2019, when Beijing crossed what was supposed to be the biggest IPO ever. Jack Ma controlled Ant Group like an insect. It marked the start of wide-ranging crackdown not just on the tech sector but on everything from private tutoring to video game blah 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 um okay but the okay so he's at the he went uh, touring the dutch research institutions to pursue his interest in agricultural technology uh, Ma believed combining the technology he researched with Alibaba's cloud computing, big data, and AI could help modernize Chinese agriculture per the SCMP. Um, he's apparently in Europe on a mission for the CCP to find new opportunities to help bolster China, Chinese agriculture using technology, something that might allow China to stop depending on Australia, New Zealand, and other countries saddled with the nickname China's breadbasket, since the world's most populous nation is also the world's biggest importer of foods. Achieving more agricultural in independence is one of Beijing's top goals. So at last, it seems as if Ma is putting his skills to use for the benefit of the CCP. Perhaps it's only the, the only reason they let him out. That's a positive thing. OK, you, you've got, you know, uh, um, he helps them. They'll potentially help him. Uh, with uh, maybe the Ant Financial IPO certainly backing off on um, Baba, and it could be a win-win situation. So that's that's actually very promising to see. I think we covered this last week, but it was uh, posted again. The China regulator suggests big tech crackdown may be coming to an end. Report says Beijing's regulatory scrutiny of fig fintech terms may wrap up this year, according to Bloomberg report. China's crackdown on tech companies for nearly a year to fix what it sees as a range of financial and social problems. Authorities identified more than a thousand issues related to fintech operations at 14 online platforms, blah, blah, blah. So um, expect more significant pro progress before the end of the year. And um, so that's that. So that's all constructive stuff. Uh, China's debt-ridden Evergrande resumes work on more than 10 property projects. Uh, I thought it was funny. They said, they told the CEO, you should pay the debt holders with your personal wealth. <laughs> but the only way you could do that is to sell the shares that are already down some 90% plus uh, to, to pay those people off. So uh, I, I thought that was kind of ironic, which would be a self-fulfilling negative spiral as he sold down the equity. The company would become more impaired and he'd be, you know, paying the, the the debt holders that as their bonds plummeted so uh not all not all ideas are good ideas uh article in fortune value stocks are unloved unsexy and poised to make a killing over the next decade we agree we've talked about why as capital has a cost uh current yield and earnings yield becomes more valuable in the present and uh and those stocks will outperform U.S. consumer confidence rose as Delta COVID-19 wave eased. So we did see a nice consumer confidence number this week. Um, increased to 113.8 in October from a revised 109.8 in September. That's as Delta is rolling away. So very, very good to see. Um, 
more positive things on the horizon. The Merck's COVID pill is licensed to UN-backed nonprofit to increase global supplies. The CEO was on today, so he's, so he's got 10 million courses to go uh, as soon as the, uh, the pill is approved. This basically means you take your home test. If you have COVID, you call your doctor, you get the pill, you can take it at home, and you're good to go. There's also an article in the Wall Street Journal that an antidepressant flu fluvoxamine significantly reduces COVID-19 hospitalization. I'm surprised this is getting uh, traction uh, in the media. It costs $4 for a 10-day course. Uh, so we'll see how, how uh, the studies work out on this. But it, the key is more and more pills, and that, that's good. Uh, Boeing, bad earnings, good outlook. What does that mean? It means that the CEO said uh, that he was, let me just get the quote, constructive and optimistic on China and in the context of before the end of the year. So what we've been saying that the catalyst is going to be China approving the 737 MAX, not because they love us, but because they need planes and they want to continue their recovery. Uh, and that's also in the context of Biden and Xi Jinping having the video call uh, this quarter. I think that um, what you'll see with Boeing is once that 737 MAX is ungrounded in China, which it has been in many other countries around the world, you're going to see the stock up 25-30% in a matter of weeks. I think that is a huge catalyst. We've been saying it for, uh, you know, months now as the stocks ground sideways but uh, I think this is imminent and I think this is going to be a positive thing you know the the earnings issue was um, you know their losses were much better than last year blah 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 they're a positive thing but the 787 Dreamliner and the uh, the Starliner Space Taxi but they'll they'll get all that worked out I mean the good news with Boeing is I think it was up a little bit today is that, you know, it's just bad headline after bad headline and the stock goes nowhere. So God forbid you get any good news. The amount of pent up energy in that stock, the, you know, the longer the base, the higher the space, I think is the saying. Uh, this is a perfect example and we'll see that with the China catalyst. So um, that's that. Next, uh, okay, the economy slowed in the third quarter on Delta surge. So GDP came in at 2%, which was below consensus estimates of, I think... 2.6 or some uh, cuffing that but i think it was 2.6 but uh, it was above the atlanta gdp now which estimated at zero uh this was obviously related to covid it was related to supply chains and if you look at this data from lpl ryan dietrich put it out um you'll see where the drop-off came was in this blue bar which is consumer spending uh, and then if you drill down, uh, Owen Mind from Bloomberg uh, put this out, and it's all related to motor vehicles and parts. So, you know, they couldn't get the uh, semiconductors for the cars. We all know that from GM and from uh, Ford and uh, all the commentary around that. That seems to be easing up a little bit. We saw some data on that. Um, I posted a chart on Twitter about some of the semiconductor Supply chain may be easing up, but the, the weakness was Delta-related and predominantly car-related, and that'll bounce bounce back uh, with, with, with no problem. Uh, this was from today. Iran to return to nuclear deal talks with Vienna next month. Uh, Tehran, so Iran's now coming to the table. They were kind of saying, give me money first. I guess uh, the West told them to pound sand, or they dropped off a suitcase, you know, uh, not a suitcase, a plane full of bills. Who, who knows? Uh, but um, anyway, they said they want to resume stalled discussions uh, on reviving the 2015 accord with the U.S. and with Europe. So uh, so that's a positive thing. That'll bring a supply on, and that'll probably take out the Johnny-come-latelys in some of these uh, energy stocks. And you don't need a lot to knock out the weak sisters. The late money, usually a 10 15% pullback on individual names is enough to take them out of the stock because uh, they'll be at a loss, and those who bought last year uh, will just ride it out and maybe top up a little bit. The big story of the week was bond yields. So midweek, we had this huge counter-trend move. So uh, since the uh, Fed meeting on September 22nd, bonds have uh, uh, fallen quite a bit, 
and yields rose quite a bit from 130 bips to 170 bips as of Friday. And then we had this huge counter trend move this week. Uh, bonds up, yields down. So this is the 10 year yield. And it's fine. It's just, you know, an uptrend consolidation. Um, but it caused a lot of pain to hedge funds. Why? Because of what we discussed on Friday on the claim and countdown, which was all these managers are on one side of the boat. The Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey said last week that they were the most pessimistic on bonds in, in the history of the survey, 22, 20 some odd years of data. And why we were saying on Liz's show that like the taper when it began, it was announced in December 2013, uh, that was the peak of rates. So rates rose from 10 year yields rose from 161 to basis points to 3% in anticipation of the taper when taper actually started. That was the peak of yields, which is counterintuitive. Most people think when the Fed stops buying bonds, yields will go up further, but the market's a discounting mechanism. It, it prices that in ahead of time. Um, so what happened because managers are dramatically levered on this short bonds trade is it did create quite a bit of shock this week. And the catalyst, uh, this is uh, Tyler Durden over at Zero Hedge did a good commentary, but what he really covered was uh, Marco Kalanovic, who I talk about a lot, he's JP Morgan strategist. He's kind of bashing Kalanovic's argument. Um, I more agree with Kalanovic, but um, so what basically happened was that what started it was uh, Canadian short end rates blew up after Central Bank ended QE and brought forward its first rate hike uh, date, followed by Australia, which similarly failed to buy uh, two-year bonds, sending the short end yields from 20 basis points to 50 basis points. That's a huge move. You can see the chart here uh, as the um, Bank of Australia effectively ended its yield curve control. So, uh, but did the world really change yesterday? And what Tyler's saying here is uh, that Kalanovic is saying that no, nothing changed. Despite the large move in yield curves, equity factors, and commodities, there was no new macroeconomic data that would, would explain such a move. No change in COVID trends. The downward trajectory continues. Um, we have some data on that. You can just see the, uh, the curve is rolling over here. These are COVID cases in case you're not sick of looking at these charts. Um, and um, and by uh, COVID trend, and no new surprise coming from corporate earnings. If anything, it's been an upward surprise in corporate earnings, and we'll get to that later in this call. Um, so then Tyler makes his argument uh, because, you know, his site is a lot of people that like gold and believe in hyperinflation and that the dollar is going to zero and all that stuff. He makes the inflation argument, uh, but he does cover Kalanovic. So what Kalanovic is saying in his note is a significant month-end rebalance flow into bonds and selling of equities, uh, CTA buying of bonds, and various media reports of funds closing their steepener positions at a loss and exacerbating the move in yields. And I think that was more likely the scenario that played out was a kind of uh, short-term dis dislocation. And this, this caught people off guard. There's no question about it, uh, particularly if you were levered in the short position, which a lot of hedge funds are. And it's, it's the right trade in the short term. Uh, but like always, when you get that many people that crowded, they're going to get caught there too long. And when everyone runs to the exits, when tapers announced, um, they're going to think yields are going to go up and because there are no remaining sellers it, the opposite is going to be true and then you'll get the the shorts covering as the first natural buyers and then you'll get a, a positive trend with that um so klonovic goes on to say the move yesterday was a large technical overshoot that will revert agree with that and he says investors should buy the dip in cyclical assets such as value small caps energy financials emerging market equities commodities 
and position for yields to resume moving higher. And in that regard, we think investors should fade yesterday's move. I couldn't agree more. But that was a huge move, and that was a huge event, and that caused all type of weird stuff happening in different sectors that uh, had counter trend moves and you know threw threw people off guard. Uh, but I I agree with Kalanovic that the general trend in the short term is yields up. The general trend should be cyclical assets outperform relative uh, to tech. Uh, there's huge value opportunity in certain pockets of emerging markets. We've been buying Turkey. Uh, last week, we started buying Turkey. Why uh, Erdogan, uh, first off, you can buy it at great financial crisis lows of uh, 13 years ago, 2008, 2009 prices. Uh, Erdogan wants to get reelected next year. He just cut rates 50 basis points. He's going to juice the economies to make sure that he can get reelected, which is a politician's number one job. And uh, and we just think it's cheap. We think there's a large enough margin of safety. It could be like Greek where it takes a few years, but I, I think there's some urgency for him to get something done. Uh, and we, we like the general story. We like the demographics. We like a lot of things related to that. So uh, Turkey, we're starting to look at some names in Brazil. And of course, uh, the biggest weight of emerging markets is China, which we've been all over uh, like white on rice. So uh, uh, that that's that. Um, moving right along, passenger throughput, just to, you know, not to dwell on this, but just to show that, you know, this is being led by leisure. Business is barely coming back. International comes back November 8th. These are going to be huge drivers. But that we're at 75% of uh, 2019 is very good. We're up almost 200% over last year. And this has been consistent. If you look two days ago, we were at one point, almost 1.99 million versus 2.3 million pre-pandemic. The day before that, we were at 2.1 million versus 2.4 million pre-pandemic. So we're closing in, and that's without business travel majorly uh, recovering yet, which it's it's starting to. Uh, so this is this is really promising to see. I want to spend a little time going through commodities. We always go through stock screens. I want to go through commodities because it'll give you, give you a better sense for the, of the economy in general. And I talk a lot about the commitments of traders. It's more of a barometer than anything else, but I've got this custom screen I did on barchart.com, and the green line is commercials. And, you know, the one thing that I've mentioned in the past and on those videos on my site is that commercials tend to be early and they tend to be right. So, you know, here you saw commercials buying, that was the bottom, and then the dollar took off. Same thing here, they were buying and then the dollar uh, took off off the bottom. And then when they're selling, they're starting to hedge, it's usually closer to a top. So they're now selling. It doesn't mean the dollar can't get a little stronger before it gets weaker, but, uh, you know, the the kind of signal is that the uptrend is starting to lose uh, momentum uh, and I'd be a I'd be more inclined to think the dollar's weaker several months out than, than a whole lot stronger in the short term it might be a little stronger so I just want to run through a bunch of these just to give you a longer term picture this is Bitcoin and ether there's not enough data and not not enough interest on my side to spend a lot of time on that um, so the opposite has been true with the euro they were sellers close to the top and now it's rolling over but now they're buying and if uh if you look here that can start to put in a bottom so if i had to look out six to to nine months i'd be inclined even if the euro gets a little weaker in the short term uh, my inclination is that dollar slightly weaker euro starts to get bid if we look out over a six to nine month horizon based on what the commercials are doing similar to the Australian dollar. Uh, commercials have been buyers. It's not a perfect indicator, but you know you see down here when it was topping, they were selling and hedging like crazy. Here, they were starting to sell ahead of this peak. And then here, they were buying at the bottom uh, in 2008. Buying here, you got to bounce. Buying here, it wasn't a great signal, but they're buying here. So on balance, six to nine months out, I think the Australian dollar is higher. Um, British pound, same type thing here. They were buyers at the bottom, buyers here. They're starting to be buyers. So it looks like in the intermediate term, irrespective of what happens in the very short term, in the intermediate term, dollar's probably a bit weaker and some of these other currencies start to get bid. Canadian dollar, uh, they've just ended quantitative easing. Commercials have been buying in advance. This probably pushes higher. 
Um, and that's consistent with what we're seeing on a fundamental basis. Same thing with Japanese yen. Commercials have been buying. Um, so that's that. Moving ahead, Swiss franc. Commercials are buying. It's, uh, it's not really doing much of anything. Uh, Mexican peso. Don't really care. Um, New Zealand dollar. Again, not really interested. Uh, Brazilian real. Commercials are starting to buy. It's it, This thing's left for dead. This could be a very interesting currency trade. Uh, I'd have to do a lot more fundamental research uh, in coming weeks to put that on. But maybe the real starts to get bid. Um, yeah, we'll see. South African rand that's been in the toilet for years. That's less interesting. Uh, Russian ruble could care less. All right. Oil, what's happening with uh, WTI crude. Uh, commercials were buyers into this weakness and, it, the, and oil broke out to new highs. Uh, let's see, not a clear signal either way. I mean, could it go up to 100? Sure, it certainly could. Um, uh, but let's, let's see. I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't want to be putting a lot. What, what I'm saying is this, we have big core positions. I wouldn't want to be putting a lot of new money on the table for energy after this run up and ahead of the Iran deal getting worked out and in the face of a huge build this week. It's just not where I want to be put, you know, aggressively putting new money. Are we selling back a lot of our core positions? No, uh, not at all. But um, but we are prepared that that the odds favor some weakness in the next couple of months uh, with all the excitement around it. Um, natural gas. Commercials are still buyers. They're starting to lean out of it. So we'll see on natural gas. That That's a tough call because, um, you know, it's it, the red is the hedge funds. Large traders have been short all the way into this rally and they've, they've uh, not done well with that positioning. Um, okay, let's see what else we want to quickly look at here. We don't get a chance to do this. So I just want to walk you through some of the things that I do every weekend just to get a feel for the market. Um, so bonds, you had seen commercials selling into this peak, then bonds rolled over, yields rolled up. They're now, they were buyers ahead of this bounce, and now they're selling. So it's kind of a mixed signal. Uh, my general view is, Bonds lower, yields higher until taper starts. And when taper starts, maybe you get a few more weeks of yields higher, but I think that could be the peak in yields for some time. I think a very similar situation to what we saw in uh, 2013. Let's just take a look here. So uh, in May is when Bernanke started to uh, intimate that he wanted to taper and then here's when he actually tapered and that was the bottom of bonds and bonds got bid for the next year and a half so maybe a bit lower here yields higher we get that two handle on the 10-year yield and then we could see a rally uh history doesn't repeat but it, it can rhyme um, and by looking at the long-term charts you get perspective on that stuff uh, this is all bond stuff Okay, euro dollar, that's just inverse rates. Um, corn, you know, the grains have had these huge spike ups. Commercials were selling into the strength, they rolled over. Now they're reversing and they're starting to buy. I don't know, do they bottom here? That's that's That goes in the too hard bin, but you could see clearly that they were getting the hell out while, while all the hedge funds were getting in uh, and the commercials are always right. So they're, they're net buyers of grains here. They might have a lot more buying to do before we find the bottom, but um, that was a pretty clear signal. With beans, soybean meal, wheat, I get to see wheat. Let's see what they're doing with wheat. Uh, I'm inconclusive. All right. Um, 
So yeah, this takes a little while, but um, well, look at this spring wheat commercial has been selling the hell against, just like they did into that strength, just like they did into that strength. They're selling the hell out of this spring wheat contract. So you know, could you get a blow off? Sure, you could get a blow off like that, but I can tell you, 12 months from now, it's probably going to be closer to 500 than 1500. Um, Oats, wow, big demand for oats, rough rice. A lot of these things like oats and rough rice are very illiquid. Uh, canola, here's something at all time high that commercials are selling against the strength. Uh, that might be a short if you can get any liquidity on the premium. Uh, S&P, they're getting a little defensive, so that's something to keep an eye on. Although the NASDAQ, they were buyers on the recent weakness in September. Yeah, it's kind of a neutral thing on the Dow. Do we have Russell? Russell, they're buyers. This is really interesting. Uh, if you look here, we've been consolidating. Russell's done basically nothing since February. So call it eight, eight nine months. Uh, it looks like the Russell wants to break out. And, you know, if you look at some of these times that commercials were buying as aggressively as they are now, those were periods before strength. February 2016, they were buying at about this level and you had a huge run. Here you only had a medium run before the COVID, but but this, this kind of implies that Russell breaks out, which I think is consistent with a lot of the macro stuff we're seeing. So small caps is an opportunity, even despite the big run which is normal in early stage of a business cycle. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, if you get a chance, what, if you're listening on the podcast, it's going to make a lot more sense if you go ahead to Hedge Fund Tips and uh, take a look at the video cast. It'll be well worth your while so you can see what we're looking at. It looks like the rest of these don't have commitments to traders data, so we're going to move right along. Um, U.S. options market bets on aggressive Fed hikes. So um, interest rate options are paying. Okay, so this is interesting. The summary is that markets are pricing in two rate hikes in 2023, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, excuse me, 2022, which I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be put off until 2023. Um So investors in U.S. interest rate options are paying for trades to benefit from much earlier than expected monetary tightening by the Federal Reserve to fight off stubbornly high inflation, including multiple hi hikes from uh, next year until 2023. Those bets have pushed volatility higher on U.S. swaptions or options on interest rate swaps, which gives the buyer the right to enter a swap contract in the future at a pre-agreed price. Swaps measure the cost of exchanging fixed rate cash flows for, for floating rate ones over a specified period are often used by investors to express views on where borrowing costs will go. The one-year forward rate on U.S. two-year swaps, that part of the curve most sensitive to rate hike expectations on Thursday, was implying a rate of 1.27% by October 2022 compared with the spot rate of 63 basis points. So the implication there is two hikes, uh, which uh, I, I think is uh, very aggressive and I think is rear view looking, I think, as these bottlenecks uh, play out. And, and it was interesting. I saw some articles today that um, Governor DeSantis in Florida is accepting cargo ships now. Everyone thought it was, he was joking, but some of the cargo ships are being diverted to the Florida ports, a solutions or oriented leader. Uh, and uh, and that may be part of the uh, getting some of those idling ships off off of Long Beach uh, and getting the toys under the Christmas tree in time for the holidays. So um, so I, I think this is a knee jerk reaction to backward looking uh, data from the last three, four months. Today, the market was up a couple of reasons. Earnings better than expected. Uh, but more than that, closer on it. 1.75 trillion dollar deal down from 3.5 that they started at also the corporate tax rate which was kind of a given was going up to 25 and i think the market was okay with that 
it looks like that's not going to change. It looks like it's going to stay at 21%, which is very, very bullish. Uh, they're fighting over the salt break. I think they're going to try to push that through for the higher income coastal cities. Um, so that's that. Uh, provisions in the Build Back Better framework include a 15% minimum tax on corporate profits for with earnings over $1 billion reported to shareholders and a 1% surtax on stock buybacks. I, you know, it's interesting. Um, the 1% surtax on stock buybacks, it's still cheaper than paying out dividends because dividends, it's double tax. The corporation pays taxes and then you as an individual pay taxes. But... I would hope that will incentivize managers to be have more discipline with buybacks and rather than buying them at all time highs to juice your options package, um, having a cost to that capital, even though it's only 1%, buy back in periods of dislocation when you should, as a good steward of capital, be buying back the stock. Um, so that could potentially be a, a net positive. 5% uh, surtax on incomes above 10 million, as well as an additional 3% on incomes above 25 million. There goes half of New York City to Miami. That's a slam dunk. Uh, the, the, this is going to take their effective tax rate to 61% for high earners. And there's just no, no, there's no reason to stay at all if you're working 60, 61% of the year for the government and 39% of the year for yourself, you've got to go to a different state uh, for starters. Um, $555 billion in clean energy and climate provisions, universal free preschool for three and four year olds, and an extension of an expanded child tax credit through 2022. So that's that. Um, how does the $1.75 billion break down? You can see it here. This is from Brian Sullivan. Child care and preschool, $400 billion. Home care, 150 billion. Child tax and earned income tax credits, 200 billion. Clean energy and climate investments, 555 billion. Affordable Care Act credits, uh, 130 billion. Medicare hearing, 35 billion. Housing, 150 billion. Higher education and workforce, 40 billion. Equity and other investments, 90 billion. Immigration, 100 billion, which is not in. This is from Cowan and Company. I don't see any bridges or roads uh, or anything useful. I guess that's going to be a, that's a separate bill, probably for 500 billion on top of this. So the social bill is 1.75, and the uh, real infrastructure I think will be about 500 billion. Um, Trump hides back fuels day trader return to blank stack, blank check stocks. The reason I bring this up um, is not to talk about Trump's back, is to talk about. Um, we talked about over the summer that all these SPACs that were bid up in the frenzy, this is an ETF that tracks like a whole basket of SPACs. The frenzy was in February, March, and over the summer we started talking about buying long dated warrants that were left for dead at 50 cents and a dollar and we bought a huge basket. Uh, well now, because of the interest in Trump SPAC, the whole group people are taking a second look at and looking under the hood to see what are these businesses, who are the principals, and there's a renewed interest in SPACs. Uh, you know, we have a five-year view on this. I mean, there's, you know, the risk to the SPAC warrants is that they accelerate it and they convert it to stock, which is less desirable than holding long-dated exposure for 50 cents that can wind up if the stock's up $20, you get 40X on the warrants over five years. And, and that's what we like. So, uh, you know, some will accelerate them, some won't because they'll want you to exercise it and take the capital into the company. Uh, and we're betting that, you know, a third, a couple thirds will, two thirds will, will want the money and you'll be able to make 40 X on some, some will be zero. But if you look at the whole basket as a whole three years out, it's probably five, six, seven X. And, uh, you're seeing that renewed interest, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the article of the week, the Don't Stop Believing Stock Market and Sentiment Results. So yesterday, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that chronicled Journey, the band's 1981 hit, Don't Stop Believing, the genesis of the Billboard hit and ending ballad to the Sopranos series, by the way, was a streak of bad luck for Journey's keyboardist and guitarist, Jonathan Cain. 
And he said in the article, uh, everything was caving in on me in 1977. I had my own band in Los Angeles, but our record deal, deal fell through. I also couldn't get to first base as a singer-songwriter. My dog got hit by a car and needed surgery, and my girlfriend, who lived with me and split the rent, left. I called my dad for a loan. Sounds more like a country song than a classic rock song, but leaving that aside, um, uh, on the phone, I told him nothing was working out. Maybe I should just give up on music. He wouldn't hear of it. Your blessing is right around the corner. Sit tight, he said. Don't be discouraged and don't come home to Chicago. Don't stop believing. He also said he'd send me the money. <laughs> While on the phone, I grabbed my song idea notebook to jot down his latest phrase, quote, don't stop believing. I wanted a reminder. Then I closed the notebook and I forgot about it. A few years later, Journey was working on its escape album and we needed another song. Steve Perry asked if I had one that was catchy. That evening while leafing through the pages, I came across my father's phrase. I came up with chords and a chorus for and a melody that I thought I could imagine Steve singing, Don't Stop Believing, Hold On to That Feeling. And in 1982, my parents came to Chicago to see Journey perform at the Rosemount, Rosemont Horizon Theater. I surprised them with the song. After when I went up to see them, my father said, very clever son, good thing you didn't stop believing. And the rest, as they say, is history and you can play the song on your own time. Um, so how is this relevant to the current stock market environment? The answer to this is twofold. Now, if you're on the podcast, you're going to get cut off in about four and a half minutes. Just go to hedgefundtips.com, click on the video cast. It's a YouTube video. Just fast forward it to minute 60 and you'll pick up word for word right where you left off. Um, so the first reason is while the market feels frothy and overvalued, there's still upside opportunity. A very close friend who has a couple million in his 401k in cash since last year called me this week and he asked me if he should get back into the market. Now, th this is a hard question for me because he knows I was pounding the table to buy everything under the sun last spring and summer. Uh, but what, what was I supposed to say now? You know, market's up 110 uh, percent. His 401k options were very limited, so I couldn't put him in individual undervalued stocks. Uh, here's what I told him to do. I said... The easy money in the general indices has been made in the short term. With the S&P up 112% off its pandemic lows, you're not going to see the same type of returns in the next 18 months. What was a low volatility environment in 2021 with 3 to 5% pullbacks will turn into a higher volatility market in 2022 with 5 to 10% pullbacks as liquidity is slowly removed from the market. That said, if you step back and look at the big picture, we're still in the early stages of a new business cycle. Looking back at 2013, the S&P gained 32.39%, anticipating the Fed's taper, and gained another 13.69% in 2014, digesting the taper while taper was happening. As it relates to a 401k, you have 15 plus years until you even look at it. I told him what I would do in his shoes with international equities, domestic equities, bonds, and inflation-protected bonds. The question is not whether he should be getting exposure today. The question is whether his $2 million 401k is going to be worth $5 million, $6 million, or $7 million by the time he starts drawing on it. And how you get there in 15 years, the rule of 72, uh, your money will double every 10 years at a 7.2% return, uh, or every 7.2 years at a 10% return. In short, who cares if we get a 10% plus correction in the next 12 months? We will. So what? With long-term money, it's about time in the market and not timing not timing the market. He can buy individual stocks and allocate to managers for alpha with other accounts and money after his long-term money is set on autopilot. He got the picture. The second reason this song is appropriate is I've never seen a market that felt so frothy and in some pockets overvalued that simultaneously had so many high quality stocks that were still on sale, dramatically undervalued and persistently suppressed in the short term. Many market participants are having a hard time looking through short-term supply chain bottlenecks, labor shortages, travel demand, material shortages, and regulatory crackdowns as it relates to several industrial staples, biotech, healthcare, travel and leisure stocks, and, uh, and Chinese tech companies. We've already seen some examples of a nascent recovery in recent weeks with Chinese tech and U.S. health insurers, but travel, industrials, biotech, and staples have remained in the doghouse. When this changes, it will change quickly. So Journey had their timeless anthem, Don't Stop Believing. When you've done your done the proper work, the fundamental analysis, and know what you own, know the value of something, not the price of everything and the value of nothing, the value of something, 
the difference between those who become exceedingly wealthy and those who never make it big is patience and temperament. So let me repeat that. When you have done the proper homework, the fundamental analysis, and know what you own, the difference between those who become exceedingly wealthy and those who never make it big is patience and temperament. If you're buying $1 worth of normalized earnings power and earnings growth for 50 cents because it's out of favor, what's the difference if it takes three months or 18 months to double or triple? That's the key. So the difference is that most people get shaken out before the double due to short-term noise or headlines or a bad quarter like we saw with Lockheed Martin this week. We bought more, by the way, uh, in accounts that, that had space. Um, th this will work its way to new highs over the next 12 to 18 months. It came in hot into earnings is really what, what happened, and uh, it was up 20% off the... Uh, um, in the last few weeks and um so that's that the short so so the difference is that most people get shaken out before the double due to short-term noise and headlines or a bad quarter short-term underperformance pressures or chasing the latest shiny odd object after it's already doubled and the juice is out of the lemon so they're stuck in a, a boeing or they're stuck in a wells fargo last year for six months when it was trading in the 20s and they see um, you know, the new shiny object like Upstart or, you know, whatever stock they were talking about on TV. And they say, oh, that one's going up. I should just chase that. Why am I waiting for this? Because when these turn, they double. They double quickly. Uh, and you know what you own. So if it moves against you, you're looking, do I have additional capital to add to it versus how do I get out because it's some Momo stock and when they crack, they're, you know, they're done. So, um, uh, okay, if you're confident you've done the work, you simply have to bide your time until the rest of the market catches up and your selection reverts back to trend slash intrinsic value. Once the shiny object chasers come after your stock, after the double or triple, you know, do the right thing and help them out. Give them exactly what they want and lay off your stock to them. As the old saying goes, when the ducks are quacking, feed them. On the other hand, if you don't know that your work is right, you shouldn't be in the name or you should be sized to reflect the lack of certainty or inherent risks in your thesis in the short term aberration and discount in the price. In short, we want to buy and add during the discouragement and inversion periods of high quality proven franchisers and sell during periods of confidence and enthusiasm for your selected security. Okay, so this is where you want to be buying, then it runs up. Then it shakes everyone out. That's where you can add in a version. Uh, or, or if you you could you you may have bought in panic, it rallies, you're excited, then it then it cranks down to discouragement. This is where you want to add, it shoots up, and then it and then it takes people out, that takes the Johnny Come Latelys out, the shiny object shaker. Uh, back in a version, you want to to be adding, and then that's when it takes off and leaves everyone behind. This is the exact chart of Wells Fargo last year. This will likely be what Baba looks like. This is what the market, uh, you know. So, so these patterns of sentiment generally repeat and repeat and repeat. We're not saying trade on a chart pattern because if the fundamentals aren't there, when it moves against you from panic to discouragement, you're going to be selling when you should be buying because you don't know what you own. You don't know the normalized earnings and cash flow trend over the last 15 years. You don't know the, the durability of the franchise uh, unless you've done your work. And you can't do that with companies that are, have one or two or three years of earnings history because you just have no idea. It's, it could be a new technology. It could be, and there can be a place for that, a small place for that type of speculation. But I like high quality companies when they're on sale and out of favor. And you can make so much money in boring stocks because you can lean in. You can also add, you know, long dated premium to, to get additional returns, but it's just predictable and rinse and repeat over and over and over. So um, now, next section is Bonds, James Bonds. Uh, <laughs> pardon, well, it's timely with the new movie. I haven't seen it yet, by the way. I got to get out there and see it. On Friday, I was on Fox Business with Liz Clayman. Thanks to Liz and Ellie Terry for having me on. In this segment, I made a highly non-consensus statement about bonds. It's not time yet, but I laid out when and why it might be time to buy bonds in the next few months. So in the short term, we think bonds are going down and yields are going up. 
when taper is announced, it may be if we are at a two to two and a half handle on the 10 year, maybe a time to start to buy bonds like we saw and went through in 2013 and 14. So we covered the chair Powell stuff. Um, we covered this. This just shows you a visual. This is when they indicated that they wanted to taper. This is the 10 year yield. Um, and then yields rose in anticipation. And here is December of 13 when they announced taper. That was the peak of yields. And then uh, yields rolled over. Bond, you would have bought bonds as yield compressed. And we have a very similar pattern uh, setting up here. So this type of thing here, this was September uh, September 22nd. The Fed meeting was this exact thing. Then rates shot up. Uh, they shot up to 170, okay, as of last Friday. So that would have been like the equivalent of right here. And then a little check back like we had this week. And then we'll probably get some more juice before they finally move ahead with taper. Uh, juice meaning uh, the 10-year yield goes over 2%. Uh, this is the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, uh, most pessimistic outlook for bonds in the history of the fund manager survey. Every single one of these points in time um, was an opportunity where you could start to get exposure to bonds. As for equities, we talked about that. We talked about Activision Blizzard, we, you know, what, just an example of a beaten down stock. And then uh, tomorrow's news today. I want to get into this because it's about earnings. On my Cheddar TV appearance on October 11th, you can click here to watch it right on Cheddar. Just before earnings season began, I said that the consensus estimates of 27.5% earnings growth in Q3 was too low and we could finish with greater than 40%. Absolutely no one was calling for that. If anything, they were saying we're not, you know, we're going to miss because of Delta and yada, 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 supply chain, margins, etc. Here's where we are as of last night with 60% of the S&P still left to report. Um, quote from CNBC, nearly 40% of the S&P companies have reported earnings and more than 80% of them have beat Wall Street expectations according to CNBC calculations. S&P 500 companies are expected to grow profits now by about 37.6% in the third quarter. So uh, I was right, huge beat. We're only 40% of the way through. We're already at 37, 37.6. 40% might have been conservative. I think we could approach 45. And why is that important? It's not important looking back. It's important because guidance will come up and we should get that move from 220 to 230 on earnings for 2022, which is going to make the multiple look cheaper. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. So that's that. Um, as far as the sentiment survey this week, you saw the bullishness come down a little bit because of that bond move. Um, fear and greed is still in a neutral position at 63. And then the National Association of Active Investment Managers, we told you two weeks ago, plus that they were going to have to chase because they were at 55%. Well, not only did they chase, they double chased. They're up to 103% equity exposure. And they might have to hang on to that into year end like they did last year. Um, and the year before that stayed elevated all the way into year end. So that's that. Um, big insider buying. Here's another example. Intel um, got sold off after earnings. So while all the managers were puking it, the insiders were buying it. They personally bought two and a half million dollars of stock on that weakness. You know, this is an $80, $90 stock probably over the next three to four years. Uh, nothing sexy, but, you know, just a steady as she goes. So that's an opportunity. Um, they've got, you know, there's the, the issue is they're spending more to create products that they'll be able to charge more for. So short term sacrifice for long term reward. They've got the twenty five billion dollar thing next to Global Foundries in Arizona, the uh, fab. And um I, I think it's, it's I think it's pretty attractive at these levels, but you have to take a longer term view, and this one will probably take a number of months to build out before it starts to make its ascent. Earnings this week, um, you know, by and large, good. I mean, we saw it with the numbers. You know, uh, tonight Apple and uh, Amazon were a little light, so we'll see about that. But that could also be a catalyst where we see a move back into cyclicals like Kalanovic has been talking about, and we agree with. Uh, for relative outperformance, and and we'll we'll keep an eye on that. 
And then finally, the economic data, uh, the consumer confidence here, you see the 113 versus 108, huge beat. New home sales, huge beat, 800,000 versus 760. <clears throat> Durable goods orders were down less than expected. That was positive. So we're going to see good employment reports in October and November for a December announcement. Uh, and um, crude inventories, this build was bigger than expected. So that coupled with Iran just keeps my yellow light on. We've covered that enough. Uh, continuing claims were very positive. That's what gives me confidence in the jobs reports. These have been bad numbers consistently for months and months. Now they've been good numbers the last few weeks. Now that the extended unemployment's rolled off, Delta's cooled down, uh, this is moving in the right direction, as is initial jobless claims also beat expectations. And uh, that's all the data we have for this week. So with that said, we went through a lot, some new stuff this week. Hope you found it helpful. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, have a happy Halloween. If you have little ones, enjoy it. You only get so many to enjoy with them, so uh, make the most of it. And uh, in the meantime, make it a great one. Thanks for listening in.